comes, Bev, just to be blunt with your viewers, when Israel is carrying out strikes inside one of the most densely populated areas of the world, even if they're aiming at their supposed bad guys, the Moss fighters, there will be civilians in the area. There is no place safe in Gaza from these types of airstrikes. And so even if Israel is purportedly working with these aid agencies, if those aid workers are risking their lives to try to get aid into Gazans, Israel's not going to suspend its operations, its airstrikes, simply because those operations are being undertaken. They have killed a series of aid workers already up to this point. Some of them work for the UN, some of them work for other NGOs. It just so happens that they hit the world's central kitchen today. And as a result, that group, which had been doing vital work in Gaza since October, has now suspended its operations. Yeah. As you point out, it was one of the few aid agencies getting into Gaza um, in this dire humanitarian situation. To your point that this is not an isolated case, the IDF says there will be an inquiry, but is there enough accountability in the end when Israel says it is taking every effort not to get civilians or aid workers targeted in this, uh, this, this campaign? I mean, look, let's, let's be blunt here. You know, when the suspect investigates himself, can you expect a clear resolution on what's happening? I mean, if we were talking about doing this properly, there should be an independent inquiry on a series of these killings, be they of aid workers, be they of other civilians, be they of journalists. But you're not going to get an independent inquiry into what is happening inside Gaza while you have an open-ended war, which is now being carried out, carried out by Israel. And if we go on to talk about al-Shifa, what has happened in that hospital in the past two weeks, and indeed has happened for months, Israel might promise an independent inquiry into the killing of hundreds of people there. But I don't think you're going to get a resolution from the Israelis, at least, which puts blame on them rather than Hamas for what has happened. You know, you, talking of al-Shifa, it's hard to categorize the, the destruction that's been left behind. I mean, in your experience and having covered many events like this, does it need to be destroyed to such an extent in, in the pursuit of Hamas? A question of whether it needs to be destroyed. When you have a perpetrator of this saying we're going after bad guys, any extent of damage is then justified by themselves. We saw this with Russia and the Assad regime in Syria. I covered that conflict for more than a decade. They wiped out almost every functioning hospital in northwest Syria and then said, oh, it's because we're going after, quote, terrorists. Israel has wiped out the majority of hospitals and medical clinics in Gaza. It's not just al-Shifa. They have killed hundreds of people in those hospitals. Um, the fact of the matter is they will say, well, we had to go in there because there were Hamas terrorists inside there. It is inevitable that when you have wounded Hamas fighters, where are they going to go to? They're going to go to hospitals. And when they do so, it provides the pretext for Israel to go in and to try to round them up. And again, any civilians who are there are simply put at risk by that. And I got to be honest with you. If Israel gets some Hamas militants or Hamas terrorists, as they call them, then that loss of civilian life appears to be justifiable for the idea. Yeah. Iran has said Israel's attack on its Damascus consulate will not go, on, go, go unanswered. Israel says it's killed Iranian commanders, but it's not a consulate. Um, it is, in fact, it says a military building. Where does the truth lie? Um, um, these are two it's, opponents. It's a consular building. It's where people, for example, who go to the Iranian embassy in Damascus go for services, for example, possibly giving, getting visas. If they're residents in Syria, they might get documents which are there. Uh, your viewers in Australia will know of consular buildings around the world like this. This was Iranian territory. I mean, because, you know, a, an embassy complex is territory of the country whose flag flies over it. Now, Israel can try to justify this operation as part of trying to degrade the Iranian military in Syria. And this is the second time it's killed Iran's top commander in Syria in the past three months. It's now more than 10 senior officers and commanders it has killed since December 25th. And Israel might justify that by saying Iran is a threat to Israel because of its links to the Assad regime and to Hezbollah. But let's be clear. 
This is a distinctive attack because for the first time, Israel has carried out a targeted assassination, which is on an Iranian site, an embassy site, rather than being on Syrian territory where the Iranian military happens to be. So to that point, because there is that differentiation, must Iran respond to this incident? Oh, I mean, it, it, the Iranian president, Abraham Raisi, every time there's an attack like that, comes out and says, we will respond, we will respond, and he'll shake his fist. From a practical point of view, Iran is boxed in in terms of how it tries to respond to this attack. After December 25th, it tried to respond by attacking American personnel through militia that it works with in Iraq and in Syria. It carried out more than 150 attacks since October on American sites. Uh, but in the end, the U.S. retaliated, killed a series of militants, uh, militiamen, and the Iranians had to back down. I think if the Iranians try a military response against Israel and against the United States, they'll get punched in the nose again. Instead, what Iran's probably going to do is to say, we're the victim here. Look, we're the victim here. Israel's the aggressor. And they will immediately point back at Gaza to try to get the political and diplomatic high ground, even as its military Effectively, the Israelis are saying, we're going to hit you and we will keep hitting you in Syria. Yeah, and it's this vicious circle because there's no question Iran is funding Hezbollah, which is also constantly targeting Israel. Right. It is funding Hezbollah and it's also supporting the Houthis, who are uh, the group in Yemen, which has been carrying out attacks on Red Sea shipping. But I think it's notable that Hezbollah, which is not a puppet of Iran, it's an ally of Iran. Hezbollah is being very cautious with the Israelis. They don't want an escalation into an all-out war on the Lebanese border. And the Houthis have backed off. They're still carrying out attacks in the Red Sea, but not nearly as many as we saw in recent months. Why is that? I suspect because the Chinese said, you're threatening our economic lifeline there. You probably should back off. So Iran's options right now are limited even through its proxies or its allies in the region. Yeah. Scott, I'm interested in your thoughts about what is uh, what the U.S. can do. We've seen that uh, sort of abstention of the vote on a ceasefire last week. It's losing patience with Israel. Um, how does it keep? Uh, how, what do you think its next move could be in terms of some of this action that Israel is taking that is 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 garnering such worldwide condemnation? If it wanted to halt Israeli military operations that we talked about, you cut military aid to Israel. That's straightforward. But in fact, as we found out again a few days ago, the United States is not only continuing, but increasing military aid to Israel. So what is the Biden administration doing? They're trying to isolate Benjamin Netanyahu. In recent days, they have spoken to the other members of the war cabinet, uh, Benny Gantz and the defense minister, Yoko Lant, who was in Washington last week, they're trying to press their case to Gallant and to Gantz. Don't go into the city of Rafa, where there are up to 1.3 million Gazans. Try to limit some of these assaults, as we have seen in terms of al-Shifa. In other words, stop being so blatant in terms of the killing. And then maybe we get space to talk about a de-escalation, if not a ceasefire. But can Gallant and Gantz, even if they wanted to, actually isolate Benjamin Netanyahu? I'm not sure they can, and let's be clear. As long as Netanyahu's in power, the Israelis will not stop this open-ended war. Yeah, that's become very clear. Scott, um, always good to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bev.